Thank you. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction to the whole uh, Wally processor pipeline. Um, I've been uh, working with Professor Harris to implement a couple of benchmarking uh, suites to, to figure out how, how, how well uh, Wally is operating. Uh, the first of these was, uh, was CoreMark. We got to a, a score of uh, 2.51 uh, core marks per megahertz with a CPI of 1.16. Um, is is uh, not too hard to get this uh, up and running, but uh, it was uh, it was a, a fun time. Um, and then the second uh, benchmarking score that we that we implemented was the M bench uh, benchmarking suite. That's uh, uh, Jeremy has been very 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 helpful for getting this to go up and running. Uh, one of the stated, go stated goals of the embarking suite is to be really uh, simple and feasible to be um, ported to different devices. And we found that this was the case for, for Wally. Um, after getting the all the, um, the porting stuff up and running, it's all now um, part of the mbench suite. So once uh, once Wally is also open source, uh, it'll be uh, super easy to, to run mbench on Wally. Um, the scores that we got uh, for the speed optimized version of mbench, we got a 1.05, so we're just 5% faster than the Cortex M4, which is the baseline that uh, mbench compares all of its scores off of. So uh, a score of one would be the exact score the core mark, oh, sorry, the Cortex M4 uh, got. And then for our size optimized um, mbench score, um, speed optimized is higher is better for size, um, the lower is better. So 1.05 is 5% faster. Uh, 1.03 is 3% larger than the Cortex M4, or rather um, than the ARM V7, because uh, the size doesn't depend on the type of processor. It just depends on the compiling options. Um, just to close out, we want to talk about uh, some of the individual mbench scores and also go into uh, some of the discrepancies we see when we compare between the ARM and um, Risk five versions. Is there a way to go to the next slide? Uh, error at the bottom. There we go. There we go. Uh, so here we have our scores uh, compiled for size. Uh, this is just dependent on the the amount of text in the actual L file that is compiled. So this isn't dependent on the Wally uh, implementation. This is more dependent on the GCC version that we're running and the different options that we compile with. Um, because this is just size, the, on the right we have the, the size scores, and then the three middle graphs on the left are all for, for speed. We have the instructions, the cycles, the CPI, and the raw um, speed score. Uh, this is all compiled for size, however. Um, interestingly, the, we're going to do a little bit of analysis at the end here, talking about some of the discrepancies, some of the higher and lower values for the scores for size, but for now we can look at the the speed scores. How do I? There we go. There we go. So uh, some of the size discrepancies that we noticed was for the metal shaw. We saw that there was a size score of 1.64, the 64% bigger than the ARM version. The metal shaw uh, 256 is the cryptographic hash. Um, and after some analysis, we we came to the determination that um, ARM has access to um, additional cryptographic um, operations such and specifically in this uh, test we use the rev the reverse and the rar the rotate um, operations uh, to create use them quite a bit in the arm versions of the middle shot so uh, because of that uh, it's significantly bigger when we build for uh, risk five um, similarly the cubic scores is um, a cubic root solver which uh, uses a lot of the um, it's uses a lot of floating point operations uh, however, we do not compile uh, the this test to use the uh, the built-in uh, graphic accelerator, the FPU. Instead, we try to uh, we do it through software emulate uh, implementation of the FPU. Um, it turns out there's a slightly different implementation between ARM and x86 in regards, or sorry, ARM and uh, RISC V in regards to the long long size, um, because ARM the long long is like half the size of the RISC V version. Um, when we implement for software, we're doing a lot of um, additional reads and writes to get the second half of the bits to save in storage. So we're essentially doing twice as many operations every time we do anything floating point related. Um, and this results in a significantly uh, significantly more instructions than the RISC V version. Um, 
And then finally, we have the CRC32 version. Uh, we noticed that our um, RISC-V version was significantly smaller than the ARM version. So this was a little suspicious. Uh, so we went in and we noticed that the, um, the size of the actual, of the code that we really care about is um, almost precisely the same, but the ARM code seemed to have some additional uh, handlers, uh, reset handlers, UART handlers, and some TIM handlers. Um, and this this was the cause of the, the size discrepancies for 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 this for this test. Um, we can move on to the speed discrepancies. Perfect. So uh, those were the scores just there for compiler for speed. Uh, for the speed discrepancies, this is uh, significantly more challenging to try to figure out uh, where these discrepancies come from. For the size, we can just compare the flags and the different. Uh, compared to the ARM and the, X and the uh, RISC V, but for speed we have to uh, do model simulation. So these are the biggest deltas that we notice. Uh, Huffbench, Wiki, and Statemate are all uh, significantly faster than how they run an ARM, and the n body um, matrix inversion and cubic are all significantly slower. Um, we don't have a, a great handle as to why this is at the moment. Uh, we were talking, uh, Professor Harris, I and Jeremy at the, before this meeting trying to figure out some next steps um, to, to figure out how to best uh, root cause that discrepancy. There was some talk of using the GProf, but uh, at the moment, this is still uh, slated for future work uh, for figuring out uh, this discrepancy. Um, and with that, uh, I think that brings us to the end of the, the benchmarking section. I think we have a, a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, and if you have any uh, ideas of how to uh, go out of best to uh, find this discrepancy. I'm um, more than willing to hear that as well. So uh, thank you. Okay, um, so this is a working meeting. Um, so thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Danny and David. And we have some discrepancies here that are hard to understand. Um, some of them are obvious. Cubic is being dropped from mBench in the future. Uh, mBench IoT, the, the current mBench benchmark suite, is intended to be for small integer processors. So having a benchmark which fundamentally does arithmetic on long doubles is not a good choice. Um, and we realized this early on in the version because RISC-V came out looking terribly, but we felt since mBench was created by a whole lot of people who came out of the RISC-V world, if we fairly late on took out the one benchmark that RISC-V did dreadfully at, we might not be perceived as impartial, so we left it in. But it's actually an inappropriate benchmark. <coughs> um, and it's not clear how it, it missed out. I, it hasn't got many floating point instructions in it, it's just that they're one and double ones, so they're absolutely crippling in terms of code size and performance. Um, yeah, Mark, Mark, add, to Mark, no, David. If I could add to that, um, Cubic involves uh, long doubles, which on ARM compiled a 64-bit, but due to the vagaries of GCC, compiled a 128-bit on RISC-V. So it really is doing twice as much work. And risk five just because of the how GCC interprets long double. And that is a choice designers are free to make when they design their ABI. There is a logical case for saying that long double should be twice as accurate as double, um, which is what risk five does. Arm doesn't do that. It says if you're on 32 bit, then what are you doing playing with long doubles anyway? We'll just make it 64 the same as double. Um, and that's a valid choice and not an uncommon one for 32 bit processors. Um, interestingly, 64-bit processors, uh, ARM 64-bit processors do have 128-bit long double in the ABI, and then you get less of a discrepancy against 64-bit RISC-V, but that's not really the class of processor for which mBench was created. So, yeah. so uh, Michael, um, put your camera on, did you have a question? Oops, uh, okay, here's the microphone. Uh, so, so uh, oops, is something wrong with my audio, it seems. Can you hear me? Yeah, you clear as anything. I, I got the different stream somewhere, so that's... Um, 
Okay, I'll just try. So uh, re regarding the uh, text textbook, uh, I just want to mention, I would be very interested in uh, checking it out. I'm not sure if we can actually establish a, an advanced level hardware design course here at Bamberg University. But still, I'd definitely love to take a look because my students we're currently taking an OS engineering course, so on the software side, uh, very much interested in uh, yeah creating hardware. So we're thinking of introducing like at least an FPGA-based digital design course here, and so it would be great to to have a closer look and maybe to stay in touch. Uh, that would be wonderful. I'll put my uh, email in the chat here. So um, I think that's something that David, because Dan is quite keen, we perhaps skipped over that. But the importance of teaching is something that comes up regularly. So I'm actively part of the uh, UK's uh, trade body for electronic systems, as I believe is Simon. And a common theme that comes up in the world of FPGAs and ASICs is actually how you bring in the next generation of FPJ and ASIC design engineers through the university system. The goal of the university system is not to sort of train you in a particular supplier's EDA tools and products, but it does need to expose you to the design decisions you need to take. And that's where having good reference implementations that are really very long are designed specifically for teaching. You know, we've got there are other open implementations, but they're designed to be you know, used in commercial things, things like chips and um, open hardware group. They're not designed specifically for teaching. So I think you have a, it's a big service you're doing there. And, um, you know, I think we'll look forward to that coming forward and perhaps we ought to get you put forward for the, um, when your book's out, get you, um, there's an Educator of the Year award, I believe, for the Risk Fire Foundation, so English Fire International, so we perhaps get you in on that. Fully agree. Uh, so, so I, I took a look at uh, using some of the old, recent versions for Komodo or the C906 and C910 from all winners. And I, I guess they're just too complex to be understandable by a student, especially because there's no documentation. So having a, a, a core that's really real world usable and not just like a, a simplified example plus the documentation in, in the form of the book, that would be really excellent especially for, for students who want to start doing research with Rift 5. So we're working on, on new approaches to virtual memory, for example, which would greatly benefit from, from a well-documented implementation of uh, PMP and, and the NMU and TLB handling. Um, so I encourage anyone else on the call. I see we've been joined by various people. Um, you can either ask your questions by turning on your camera and microphone, or do just type them in the public chat, and we will um, uh, pick them up now. I think it's also important, David, that you, you're doing a 64-bit Linux class processor. Um, I think it's pretty well established that RISC-V is doing a good job in the small microcontroller market. It's a lot easier to design a small microcontroller than it is to design a, a proper multi-core Linux um, capable uh, machine. And it's still the case that there are precious few of those available. You know, there's high five unmatched, but you can't buy them anymore because they haven't done it. They've, run, they've stopped the production run. There is the, um, the oh, I've forgotten the name of the company, the guys who do the uh, PAC, PAC, P extension um, in Taiwan. In Andy. Andy's have got their chips out now. You can get them through Renesis on boards. But actually, I did go and talk to Renesis, and they're uh, for favored partners only. Um, so, you know, there is a dearth of. Linux class there, and part of that I think is because lack of you, know, you need a big team of engineers, and you need a team of engineers to understand the issues around uh, developing. Simon, you've raised your hand. What would you like to say? Yeah. Um, so I've got several questions actually. That's okay. Um, from from simple ones. Says, I mean, uh, David, as you were talking, you you said on slide six, you said you left the optional generate statement out on the system Verilog, which sort of confuses me because. I always think it's a good idea to put these optional things in, to, especially when you're teaching. So I was wondering why, if it's educational, why you left optional statements out. Right, we uh, we started with them in, and 
over time, we uh, developed a code idiom style, like, like what you see on this slide, uh, in which uh, we wrap ifs and fors around to uh, generation. Um, and we just found the code uh, was cleaner and we felt more readable uh, without the extra unnecessary syntax. Yeah. Yeah, 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 the generate can get quite complex, but it's 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 useful because it shows it's a structural time thing rather than a behavioral, you know, it's not a runtime thing. That's in that way, it's quite good. But uh, it's language design, but you're right. I mean, a generate isn't very clean. That, that was a simple question. So um, the next question really is, you said um, uh, as a throwaway comment, most of your bugs in verification were in the privilege mode. Um, so. Yeah, I thought that was quite interesting because when you listed your tests, there weren't a lot of them. I mean, that that is the challenge that RISC V faced today is there is not a lot of good tests in the public when open source for a privilege mode. And that is uh, a challenge. And I was wondering if you'd done anything like um, either source code coverage on your RTL or functional coverage to see what actual coverage you really did achieve before, obviously, because when you, by the time you're booting Linux, you know, 500 million instructions, which is a phenomenal achievement. When something goes wrong, it's almost, it's, you know, 30 hours later. I mean, uh, you know, I've been involved with stuff like that. It's very hard at that stage. So I was just wondering, you know, what the types of issues could have been resolved if there had been better tests, you know, because that's from our point of view, we're always interested in the types of tests that are missing that people need in there. And then I'm curious about what sort of RTL, code coverage you got or functional coverage if you measured those? So I'm just curious about the verification. Oh, that's a great question. And unfortunately, uh, we have not uh, done uh, systematic code coverage yet. We we dabbled with that um, about a year ago, and then we had more pressing things to um, get going. Um, we began with the Empiris Suite as our first set of uh, sanity. And that was really helpful. And um, you guys gave us some great support getting started. Oh, okay, um, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's good. Um, Thank you. And then we also adopted the um, Risk Five Arc Test uh, Suite, um, and that covered the core instructions pretty well. Uh, we added our own suite uh, last summer and improved it. Um, uh, this this past spring and summer of um, directed tests, uh, first for the, all the MMU and then for other parts of the privileged unit and now um, for the peripherals. Um, and these are not nearly as comprehensive as we'd like. Uh, we know the risk 5 arc test group is trying to do some work on privileged tests and part of the challenge is there's so many different legal configurations <laughs> that even defining what the values should be is, is difficult. And um, in our case, we were finding there are many legal outcomes for certain events. And we've just ended up uh, writing a set of tests that check that um, we do a legal outcome, um, but not whether we do any of the legal outcomes. Um, and that's a much harder task to solve as I'm, I'm sure you're painfully aware. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think I think essentially in the Risk 5 International Group, there's been lots of conversations on that because we've been involved for about five years on that. But yeah, it's, and I think part of the beauty of Risk 5 is it gives you the freedom to do lots of things and make choices, but that also is the Achilles heels because it's, it's very hard to demonstrate compliance when there's so much freedom. I mean, it's a, it's a real challenge on that. And actually, I did notice in the RISC-5 international stuff, you talked about test float, which obviously is a much more comprehensive uh, test approach and, you know, that uh, that you'd used in there. And that, yeah. Okay, but so, so you don't, didn't do functional coverage or code coverage to find out what you tested. No, um, no. But you wrote, you said, you said you wrote your own directed tests for several of the privilege mode bits. Okay. What about... What about a stream generator? Did you use uh, a, a RISC V stream generator for instructions and stuff? Um, we uh, explored um, Google DV a little bit mm. and we'd like to get there, but we just haven't had time yet. Mm, okay, yeah, because it's very good and it's open source, which is very good. And uh, just my last thing was you said, um, I think you said that the RTL is close. Uh, 
Yeah, and yeah, my question is how close to sort of RTL sort of freeze or sign off are you? So I think you said the div divide's still being worked on, and then you said you're going to open sort stuff up in near the end of the year or something. So how how complete is the RTL really? Is my question. So the last feature that's missing is square root, um, and um, we we are hoping we have it working this week. <laughs> Um, and we're, we're trying for a manuscript release in end of August, um, associated with the, um, opening up the code at the same time. But again, we're, we're happy to share now if anybody wants to collaborate on it. I mean, from an Imperial's point of view, we'd be very interested to, to explore a little bit more with you about what you tested from a privilege mode point of view, because obviously we're, we're verification focus not core focus but so if at some point you wanted to have a conversation like that i think you probably got my email just give me an email and be good. Uh, it sounds like a very interesting project and it's good that you've also added the peripherals too so it's more than just the core it's like a, a more con it's a good controller as well because you can actually boot linux on it which is great real achievement that is in rtl thank you i'll i'll send you an email and we can set up a time to talk more okay. yeah that's good That's my question, Jeremy. I'm finished. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, that was uh, a lot of useful comment and discussion. That's the purpose of these me these meetups and so forth. Um, uh, so, David, Danny, you you talked about the short term about getting the design sign off and then getting this uh, properly open sourced, and I think that will be a tremendous uh, asset for the wider community. Um, and I guess then, where do you see the longer term going with this? Once you've got your book published, you know, where are you going, where are you going after it? Where, what's the long term strategy you have for working on this? Uh, we're, uh, we're sorting that out, and I think it will depend in some extent on adoption and interest from market reviewers. Um, some of the low hanging fruit, we'd love to add more of the extensions, the bit manipulation and cryptography and uh, new and compressed stuff, um, I think will be a modest amount of effort and um, add some good capabilities. Um, the big feature we're missing right now, um, one is uh, multi-core and the other is a uh, out of order um, multi-issue architecture. And um, so those are both on our long-term wish list, but I think that would be another version of Incore. Okay, that, 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 okay, that's cool. I think the multi-core, it's interesting, you know, you're a compiler, right? So I know quite a lot of people developing these sort of cores. And understanding how to do multi-core properly, which is essential to a modern Linux system, is um, is where a lot of problems seem to occur. We get these little things, oh yes, well, yes, we're going to give you first silicon or first FPJ or whatever. And we're just sorting out a few problems with the... Um, Atomics and the synchronization, and it turns out actually quite hard to get that right in a sensible way. Um, so I think, yeah, long term, if you can teach a generation that knows how to do that job properly, that will be very valuable. 